do they do they choose did NASA choose to uh, filter what they display to the community to or, or or they themselves don't know and also uh, the uh, the astronauts uh, I watched the um, uh, the footage when they come back and they are very they don't look super happy they don't look oh I bit to the moon no they are like traumatized or or you know this this disappointing I don't know Go on. <laughs> okay. So, all right. Now let's lay this out very carefully because this is a very complex question. Okay. First of all, what is NASA? We brought over thousands of the highest level Nazi scientists, between, by we, I mean the United States, mm -hmm. between 1945 and 1947 in Operation Paperclip. It was the first major operation run by the CIA. The CIA was, and as soon as the CIA was created, the CIA made its business the importation of thousands of Nazi scientists into the United States. And the CIA, by the way, was co-constituted uh, by the incorporation of the East European Nazi spy network of General Reinhard Galen into the American OSS. So the CIA is case. not even uh, originally American, isn't it? No, it, it, it's, it's at least half Nazi German from its foundation. Good and work. the first thing they did was bring over thousands of Nazi scientists, and it's called paperclip because it's a reference to the paper clips used to, you know, uh, hold together fake dossiers that they created for each of these scientists, sanitizing their war crimes, making it like they were, you know, oh well, you know, he just didn't know what he was doing. He joined the Nazi yeah. party. He happened to join. Hey. The no. um, yeah, I mean, look, Werner von Braun was an SS major. He wasn't some, you know, random. The guy was an SS major who used slave labor inside hollowed out mountains to build V2 rockets that rained down on the civilian population of London. This is the guy we made the head of the Apollo program at NASA. This is the guy who was responsible for the Apollo program at NASA. And the Apollo team that SS Major Werner von Braun put together consisted 70% of his Nazi SS buddies. Mm. And also, these plans existed. I mean, their aerospace, you know, vision was way ahead of anybody else's. And when Von Braun came, the re, one of the reasons he was put in charge of this project is he had all the technical papers from Nazi Germany. The Germans were planning to go to the moon in the 1940s. Anyway, be right. that as it may, okay? That's the first thing you have to recognize, that NASA is a largely Nazi institution at its foundation to the, to the degree that they are planning Apollo missions to coincide with the dates of holidays that were only celebrated in Nazi Germany. Like for example, Hitler's birthday. They would set missions, important missions for the dates of holidays only celebrated by the Third Reich, okay? Wow. So that's the first thing you have to understand is who, who built up NASA. Well, that means NASA was built with SS mentality, which means that it was an incredibly hierarchical, internally compartmentalized, institution where you only knew as much as you needed to know to get your job done. And so I would say probably 95% of people working at NASA have no clue what's going on behind the scenes at the highest level or what ultimate purposes their uh, you know, work is actually serving, their technical work is actually serving. So that's one thing, compartmentalization of information. So here's the thing. So in 1960, I think it was, 62, 63, sometime in the early 1960s, hmm. uh, there was a um, sergeant who was a photographic repairman with a top secret security clearance whose job was to repair any of the machines involved in processing the photos coming from satellites around the moon, right? So they were getting ready to go to the moon. They were taking these satellite photo photographs of the moon. And this repairman's job was to go and to fix these machines whenever they would break down machines that are creating mosaic photographs from satellite imagery of the moon. And he was sent not to NASA to do this. He was sent to a national security agency building near an air force base okay. to go repair this machine. And the guy walks in there. And first of all, he said, this is Sergeant Carl Wolf. And his testimony is part of the disclosure project, you know, archive. He said that as soon as he walked in there, the place 
was full of scientists from all around the world, Japanese people, Europeans, you know, even like Indian people, scientists oh, wow. from all different countries and ethnicities. He said they all looked like they had been gut punched. They looked like the shit had been kicked out of them. They were appalled. They looked like in a very bad state of mind. Oh. And they all have these security clearance badges on. And then he's let in and they're all whispering to each other. And mm -hmm. he's let into the uh, photograph processing room where he's supposed to repair this machine. And everyone in the room leaves when he comes in, uh, except for one sergeant, guy was the same rank as him, who was responsible for basically monitoring this guy and making sure he didn't do anything wrong, right? And this sergeant was at his wit's end. He, he was a nervous wreck. And while he was alone in there with Carl Wolf, he basically broke protocol. And I think probably because he couldn't contain himself and he was, you know, he just ready to lose his mind. He started and he needed to tell somebody. He started showing Carl Wolf the photographs that were coming off this machine that he was supposed okay. to repair. And photo after photo showed this megalithic city on the dark side of the moon with huge uh, towers, spherical structures, obelisks. Uh, and it was all apparently made of a kind of poured stone. The, the material was not metallic or you know, glass or anything like that. It was like what you find in uh, Humapunku oh, or okay. yeah, Tewanaku or Egypt or the Osirian and Abydos. So it was a kind of extremely uh, high precision jigsaw puzzle fitted together, molded stone-like material. Well, My guess is that this stuff that we're looking at in, in Egypt or in Pumapunku or whatever, it's not stone. It's something like concrete. They probably poured this stuff into a mold of some kind. Because if you look, some of these stones, they have like 12 different points of intersection with the stones around them yeah. in a jigsaw pattern. And it turns out, by the way, that this engineering methodology is extremely earthquake resistant. It's the best defense against yeah. an earthquake because basically the blocks, they, they will shift and then lock back into place. Mm -hmm. So he sees these photographs of this city on the dark side of the moon. And the sergeant says to him, yeah, you know, we're told to airbrush all these out of these pictures before we release them to the public. And wow. so my guess is that in the Apollo period, they were airbrushing all this stuff out of uh, lunar photographs, including images of UFOs on the moon. There have been many UFOs sighted on the moon, uh, not only by the astronauts in the Apollo program, but also cited by astronomers while looking at the moon, particularly during eclipses, when you can see, you know, the, the disk of the moon is blocked out. You can see the UFOs coming out and crossing the surface of the dark moon. This has been observed on a number of occasions, going back, by the way, even a couple hundred years to the early astronomical observations of the moon. Oh, it's um, the same kind of technology that uh, they used to build those amazing megalithic buildings in Saxayoman and Egypt and uh, Central America as well and Mesoamerica and also in some hidden places in China, right, which is the, the pyramids in 45, I think, pyra giant pyramids in China, but the government, Chinese government doesn't much go in there. And uh, not to mention the moon, the, the, the mummies, right, the mummies, it's Iranian mummies and now like, it's, uh, it's mind blowing. And um, I've been to Peru and I saw very close the the structures of Saxayaman and you come it's just amazing you can't flip you know a, a feather between the no a hair nothing can go in and you can clearly see the difference between the two kinds of uh, architecture such as the uh, uh the the 1400s ones comparing to the most ancient ones which are much more uh, sophisticated. Hey everyone, catch the full episode of this fascinating interview with Dr. Jason Reza Giorgiani here on this very same channel, okay? Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and why not, comment and share with your friends, okay? So thank you very much and take care.